Bible is filled, filled with a lot of stories about people uh, that you might call obscure, uh, not well known. Uh, but some of these people were used very mightily of the Lord. And, you know, there'll be uh, descriptions of them and, and the deeds that they did. Very short mention of them, and then they kind of fade away, and they never mentioned again. And so I just want to touch on some of these people uh, that the Bible mentions, but then I want to speak a little bit on one in particular. In Second Samuel chapter 23, verse 8, uh, there was a man named, and I'm not sure of the pronunciation of his name, but I'll say his name is Adino, and he was one of David's mighty men, and uh, David had many men of valor that fought with him, and uh, he killed 800 men at one time with a spear. And these be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tachamanite that sat in the seat chief among the captains. The same was Adino the Esnite. He lifted up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And as far as I know, that was the last mention of him. But he did great deeds as God empowered him. I'm sure uh, that he didn't do that on his own. He wasn't able to do that as an own, in his own power. So we'll look at another man named Eliezer, Eliezer, Eliezer. And that's in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 9 through 10. And he was another one of David's mighty men. And he stood boldly in the day of battle, and he fought so long, and that he killed so many Philistines that he could not even open his hand to release his sword. After him was Eli Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahonite, one of the three mighty men with David. And when they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. Next verse. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. So there's another example of some not well-known people that God worked mightily through. Another one we have is Shama, and we can see this in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 11 and 12. He was another one of David's warriors. He stood alone in a field of peas, and he fought the Philistines, and God gave him a great victory. After him was Shammah, the son of Aji, the Hararite, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. You see, sometimes in your life, you're going to come across something that's worth fighting for. And you have to make a stand. And then we look at the widow of Zerapath, and we see this in 1 Kings chapter 17. And she fed the prophet Elijah, and she sheltered him during a famine. And then we have the Israelite maid who told Naaman about the man of God. And you remember Naaman, he, uh, he, was, he, came, he came down with leprosy. And uh, she told her master about the God of Israel. And this led to his cleansing from his leprosy, leprosy and his spiritual conversion. And then we have the little boy who gave his lunch to Jesus. And we can see this in John chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. He gave the little that he possessed, and God used that tiny portion of food to feed a vast multitude of people. Uh, 
When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, and he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one may take a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. And now there was much grass in this place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed it to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that they had eaten. Again, we don't know the name of this young man that gave him the loaves and the fishes, but, you know, even if you don't have much to give God, God can use what you have to do his will. Amen. And then we have the woman who anointed the Lord and washed his feet with her hair. And we can see this in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. And I, I won't read all those for time's sake. But she performed a labor of sacrificial love on our Lord Jesus. And then we have Joseph of Arimathea. And I think most of us are familiar with him and what he did. And you can find that in John chapter 19, verses 38 through 40, 42. And at great personal risk and cost, Joseph buried the body of Jesus. And we can read those two verses. John chapter 19, 38 through 42. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. And he came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of Jews is to bury. And now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new sepulchre, sepulcher, wherein never a man yet laid. And I could go on. The list is longer. It seems that God chooses those sometimes who are obscure to accomplish his work in this world. And the passages before us are no exception. So let me introduce to you a man named Shamgar and I hope I'm producing, pronouncing it correctly. He is an unknown man who appears on the pages of the Word of God, and he is used by God in a great way. And then, it's, then just as God uses him, he vanishes back into the shadows from which he came. And not, known, not much is known about him. He's only mentioned twice in the Bible. And we can see this in Judges chapter 3, verse 31. And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. And we also see him in Judges chapter 5, verse 6. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through the byways. So those are the only two passages that he's mentioned. But what is said about him reveals a man of character and courage. The little information we are given about him 
reveals a man whom God in a great way used. And I want to look at the little we know about Shamgar today, but I want to make a, three observations about this man. And one of them would be Shamgar the worker, and number two would be Shamgar the warrior, and number three would be Shamgar the winner. And we'd like to just uh, notice these observations as um, I share what I have with you this morning. His name, Shamgar, means either sword or cupbearer. Either name would fit in with the details that we have concerning this man. He was like a sword in the hand of God. As God used him to destroy the enemies of Israel, he was like a cupbearer who brought the cup of God's wrath to those that God would judge. He is called the son of Anath. Now, you could look at a couple of different ways that, I mean, he could be actually, his father's name could be Anath. But there was another notation that um, the Canaanite goddess of war was called Anath. And maybe that was a nickname for him. I'm, I'm kind of going with his father's name was Anath, but I, I thought I might mention that. And uh, the other thing, he could, he could have been from the town of Anath. So those are three things that were for a possibility of um, why he was called Anath. One thing we know for sure about Shamgar was that he was a farmer. He carried and fought with an ox goad. Now, an ox goad was not a weapon, but it was an agricultural tool. It was a pole about eight to 10 feet long. And it was about two inches in diameter and one end was tipped by a long iron point. And the end was used to encourage the oxen he was driving to move. In other words, you have the team of oxen, and if they didn't want to move, you could give them a little poke with this sharp end of the, the ox code. And I might add that eight to 10 feet would be a good length if you're messing around poking an ox. Uh, the, the oxen might not want to respond to voice commands or the pulling of the reins, so, you know, they may respond to the sharp point of the ox goad. But the other end of the tool was shaped like a spade, and it had a metal blade, and they used it to clean the wet clay off the plow. It would stick to the plow, uh, the plow points, or perhaps if there were roots or other impediments, they used to scrape off the plow. So one end was a point, the other end was uh, like a spade. But uh, I would imagine it, it could be a deadly weapon if, if used correctly. Another thing we know about Shamgar has to do with the time in which he lived. It was a very difficult time for the people of Israel. And you can see that in Judges chapters 4 through 5. When you go home, you get a chance, you can read that. It talks about the times in which they had lived. The nation of Israel was being oppressed by Jabin, the king of Canaan. Jabin was a powerful enemy who possessed 900 iron chariots. You can see that in Judges chapter 4, verse 3. And his army seemed totally unbeatable. As was the custom in those days, he probably would not allow the Israelites to arm themselves. So you could see if they were not allowed to arm themselves, something like an ox goad or whatever you may have in your hand, you know, for lack of better choice, you could be used as a weapon if you had to. So at this time, Israel was oppressed by Canaan, and they were also under attack by the Philistines. And one of the great lessons we can take from Shamgar is that God tends to use those who are already busy. When God called Shamgar, he called a man that was already busy. Shamgar was a man who was actively working to feed and care for his family. And when the enemy came, God used Shamgar as his chosen instrument. 
God does not use lazy people in any great fashion. When he looks at the church and places his hands on folks to use them, he always chooses them who are actively engaged in his work already. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that he saved us to serve him. As we are faithful to the work and the small task that he assigns us, he will, op he will open larger and more important avenues of service. If he cannot trust you in the small tasks, he will never use you in greater ways. I've seen that in this church myself, how God has saved people and they come in and make themselves available to be used by God and God uses them. And, you know, it's like a progression, okay? You could come into the church, you could empty the waste baskets, you could maybe move up to vacuum in the rug, as, um, you know, the leadership of the church sees that you're faithful in your tithing, in your uh, uh, faithfulness in showing up to uh, prayer meetings, to hear the preaching of the word, um, as he sees your faithfulness to, to God, um, You will be promoted. You know, do, do not despise um, small beginnings. I mean, I remember when I first came here, we were in the other building. And I, I don't know how much time had gone by, but I started coming to empty the waste baskets and back in the church. And I don't know if it was before or after I started doing the video and uh, I was ordained as a deacon. And you never know how God's going to use you. And so, I never thought I'd be up here. But it's a progression. I don't know what he's got for me next. I don't know how he wants to use me uh, or where he wants to take me. But I want to be open to whatever he wants to do. So the day in which we live uh, at times can be hard for servants of, a, of the Lord. It seems that sometimes the government and society are growing in their hatred of the Lord and his work. Now, thankfully, we have a president now that uh, things seem to be a little easier. He's a man that seems to surround him people, himself with people that seek the Lord. So I'm thankful for that. But, um, you know, we still have the world to deal with, and it's getting harder and harder as, as, as we draw closer to the end of, of these last days. And it's harder in, the day, in this day to raise Christian families. I mean, there's so much... Um, there's so much things of the world that bombards us uh, that sometimes it's hard to keep the children on track as well as ourselves. But here we find ourselves. These are the days that you know God has chosen us to live in and work in. And the challenge is to do the best that we can where we are. You know, 
serve the Lord in your home, serve the Lord in your Sunday school, serve, serve the Lord in any ministry that you can find. The Lord is watching, and he takes notes on your faithful service. And he will bless you, and he will use you. So we want to look at, that was Shamgar the worker, now we want to look at Shamgar the warrior. And as I, as I said a few minutes ago, the Israelites were being oppressed by the Canaanites under King Jabin and his powerful army. Jabin had disarmed the Israelites, and he had made them weak militarily, so they had no weapons. They were not in a position to defend themselves. This provided an opportunity for the Philistines, which were a warlike people uh, that lived near the Mediterranean Sea, to take advantage of the situation. And they would invade Israel and capture slaves. They would steal crops and they would destroy villages. So when the Philistines came, most of the people in Israel would flee in terror. They wanted to avoid death or capture. Shamgar, however, refused to flee. When the Philistines came, he stood and he, and he fought. He did not have any weapons of war, but he had his ox goad. And while this was a tool, it could also be used as a weapon. It would have replaced a spear on one end, and it could have served as an axe on the other end. And the long uh, pole could have been used to block blows by a sword. Shamgar took what he had, and he used it to secure the victory for his people and safety for his family. Over the course of his life, he killed 600 of the Philistine raiders using the heavy ox go. And to do that, he would have had to have amazing physical feet. He was a man who was in top-notch physical condition, but his power wasn't merely physical. His power was also spiritual. Shamgar was a man empowered by God for this task. And there can, no, it can be no doubt that the Spirit of God enabled Shamgar to stand and fight like he did. Shamgar stood his ground and fought while others ran because Shamgar knew that some things were worth, were worth fighting for. He was fighting for his home, and he was fighting for his family, his freedom, and his land. He was fighting for the right to worship his God. Shamgar was a physical and spiritual powerhouse. He was a fighter used in a mighty way by the Lord. And you know, many of our brothers and sisters, as I read this, how he fought for the right to worship his God. I think about some of our brothers and sisters in the world in different countries who are imprisoned or it'd probably be better if I let my wife share this, but she shared when her and Linda went to uh, Connecticut there was a there was a man from Egypt who shared what he had gone through and probably is still going through if he if he went back. Was he going back? No. Yeah, if he went back they'd probably kill him. But some of the things that he went through, um, but you know, he, he withstood the things that he went through, and I'm not going to get into what he went through, but there were some terrible things. Um, but it was worth fighting for that he was able to worship his God. Um, and I just want to remind you this morning that while we are here to be workers, we are also here to be warriors. When God saved us, he enlisted us in his army and set us about the business of spiritual warfare. And we can see that in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. While the flesh lusts against the spirit, 
and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Why are we at war today? We are at war with Satan. And like the Canaanites, he would oppress us. We are at war with the world. And like the Philistines, it would invade us and take everything away that we value. We are at war, and some things are worth fighting for. Some things cry out for us to stand our ground and fight. And if we do not fight and protect the things that matter the most, we will see them taken by the enemy and destroyed. And what kind of things am I talking about this morning? The home, your marriage, your spouse and your children are worth fighting and dying for. There are no sacrifice too great or price too high for those whom God has given into our care. We should fight for it, for their salvation and righteousness. We should fight it to the death if necessary to protect them from the world and from Satan. The church, the world would slip in and take away the things we value as a church. Things like the word of God, our preaching, our worship, our doctrines and our separation are all under the attack by Satan and of the world. Every day the world makes inroads into the church, and we must be willing to fight and die for the things that we believe are right. The lost. A lot of them, they don't know God, and they don't even care about God. But they need someone to stand in the gap. and maintain the old ways so that they might hear about Jesus. They need people to pray for them. They need people who will not run from their vileness and sinfulness, but will, who, who will tell them about Jesus. They need someone who will fight for them, someone like someone fought for us. And even if you can't think of anyone that did it for you, Jesus did it for you. And what he went through for us, the least we can do is stand and fight for others. So my question is, do we have any saints of God who will sign up today for a fight, to fight the good faith for those things that are worth fighting for? Somebody get me a cup of water, please. Thank you. So that was Shamgar the warrior. And now we're going to be looking at Shamgar, the winner. The Bible tells us that Shamgar delivered Israel. His courage freed the people around him and allowed, and allowed them to live in freedom and liberty. He made a difference in the lives that he fought for. And we can make a difference in the lives of people that we fight for. We are fighting for things that truly matter. And it may seem at times that there are very few victories here. And in spite of that, the fight is still worthwhile. Thank you, Tara. Because we are willing to fight this fight, others have the hope of a better future. You know, we're, I believe we're living in the last days, and I don't know if... You know, no man knows, no man knows the time, but 
if God should tarry and there is another generation, we, <clears throat> we as a church have to pass down a pure gospel to the next generation. I just want to encourage us today as a church body to, to stay in the battle. I've heard different stories of uh, the percentage of pastors leaving their churches, leaving the ministry. Uh, I haven't heard anything lately, but the last time that I heard it, it was, the, the number was quite high. Um, I think a lot of them get discouraged. Uh, maybe even some of it, they just get burnt out. But uh, we must be steadfast in the Lord's work. And uh, even when we feel like quitting, we must be encouraged to keep on. You know, we're, we're human and we go through things and we can get discouraged and at times, I'm sure many of us have not felt like going on. But when you look at the greatest example of steadfastness of all, it was Jesus. Um, and what he went through, he encouraged us to to continue. He, uh, he stood his ground uh, on an old rugged cross and he defeated the works of, of the devil. So let that be an example of us to keep fighting so that we can say with the Apostle Paul that I have fought a good fight and have finished my course. I have kept the faith Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. And you can find that in Second Timothy verses four, uh, chapter four, verse seven through eight. So what can we take away from the study of Shamgar? who I would call the obscure savior, saving his people from uh, the Philistines. What lessons can we glean from our own lives? Let me suggest a few. You see, God can use anyone, even those who you think that are, no, that are nobodies. There's nobody here insignificant in the body of Christ. We are a body ministry, and everyone... Uh, can be used of God. If you're not sure of your giftings, I would suggest that you seek the Lord wholeheartedly and find out what your giftings are that you can be used in this body. I mean, we have a lot of empty chairs here. And, you know, we're, we're God's voice. We need to go out in the world and be a witness for him. And, and as we do that, I mean, we're seeking God's presence on Monday night. And I believe as time goes on and we're more dedicated and spend more time seeking him, as we're in his presence, he's going to show us some things. I believe he'll show us some things to advance his kingdom. And we need to be ready. So, Shamgar fought where he was and when he was. He did, he did not give in to fear. He did not wait for better circumstances. He just took his stand for God and he won the victory. Shamgar fought with what he had. And no matter how weak you think your weapons are, 
if you put them in the hand of God and watch him do great things with them. And some examples was, um, as, as we just looked into Shamgar with the ox code, but Moses had a rod. David had a sling. The widow uh, had the meal and the oil and the lunch of a little boy and how God used them mightily. Uh, Shamgar stood his ground. He had made up his mind to fight. Shamgar left the results to God. Every time he fought, he put his life on the line. Shamgar trusted God with his life. Live or die, he would stand for the Lord and for what was right. Shamgar enjoyed the victory. Every time he fought, Shamgar walked off the field of battle with victory. God honored his faith, and he will honor yours too. As I said before, you know, um, this is a body ministry, and everyone has a role to play. There's not one person that's significant in the kingdom of God. So what is God speaking to you this morning? You know, there are many unsaved, and who will stand in the gap? these people. I mean, there's a lot of people in this world, but we need to start right here in this city, in this local area. <clears throat> so as I look at Shamga in the natural, he had an ox goat as a weapon, and he slew 600 and I just want to take that and kind of switch it over to the spiritual, where we are armed with um, the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. And being armed with those, why can't we go out and win 600 souls? You know, as Pastor preached a while back, that we should have active faith and not passive faith. So, in closing, I, I don't like to end a service without giving people the, uh, the ability to come to the altar and seek the Lord, what he may have spoke to them during the preaching of the word. But as I said, on Monday nights, we're not seeking, you know, blessing from the Lord, you know, I need this, I need that, but we're seeking him for his presence. And uh, as I said, as we do that, we need to be prepared for what he's going to speak to us because I believe, you know, he's got, he's got some things to tell us. So, Bobby, if you could play a little something in the background. I would just like to invite those of you who may... have been touched in their heart this morning by this message that we need to press in. As I said, I believe we're in the last times. I don't know how much time we have left, but are we doing what God has called us to do? Are we being faithful in the things that he has called us to do? I know times we grow weary and I know many of us work, but there's no excuse. We must shake off that tiredness, shake off the things that take away our time to spend with the Lord, whether reading his word or in prayer. And once again, I'd just like to open this altar to those who may want to come and seek what the Lord would have to say to them this morning.
If there are any of you here that need to leave, I just ask that you do it quietly. And I'm in no hurry here this morning. If you need prayer, please come forward. And those of you, like I said, that have to leave, please do so quietly while some may be here praying.